Welcome to another episode of Victoria's Lounge from Fairmont to the Norfolk. Now, today's topic is not an easy one. It is often seen as the silent epidemic. For those living with mental illness are made to feel as though they should be in denial ostracized by society because of the stigma that comes with. And for those from the outside looking in, they often don't want to have anything to do with a mental case. But today you're going to meet some individuals who are living with a mental illness, but want to have a healthier view of it and raise awareness. But before we start that conversation, meet my guests. Cornel Ngare is a special projects writer for the Daily Nation. He was diagnosed with clinical depression in August 2015. Since then, he has been more interested in mental health and written about it on different platforms. Enid Ongaya was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in December 2015. Since then, she's been raising awareness on mental health in Kenya and Africa. She plans to start a foundation that will subsidize medical care and psychosocial care to persons diagnosed with mental illness. Dr. Susan Gitau, or as she likes to call herself, Counselor Susan, is an accredited therapist and clinical supervisor with Kenya Counseling and Psychological Association and a lecturer at the Africa Nazarene University. Eva Kayangonda found that she suffered from depression and anxiety a few years back and decided to focus on raising awareness on mental health. She started an NGO, the Mental Health Awareness Center, to advocate and influence positive change on mental health in society. Remember, hashtag Victoria's Lounge is how you can chime into the conversation on social media. Now, Cornell, one of my guests, had actually raised this whole point of why am I the only guy on the panel? And it really is a picture of what it's like when it comes to the whole discussion on mental health and mental illness here in Kenya. Many men don't want to talk about it. But Cornell, for you, what was it like when you first found out that something is up? Um, I guess for me, I can say I found out by accident because uh, first, um, I just I was just going through my normal day. You know those days you wake up and you have the Monday blues and you don't feel like going to work. But now for me it kind of happened the next day and the next day and the next day. I just waking up and you're struggling to go to work. I go to the office, I can't do anything. But I thought I'll get over it because that's what people do. You know, you, you try everything, energy drinks, but nothing was working. Mm -hmm. So after a while, um, I would start losing sleep, um, I would start in the morning, I would sleep in quite late and then it got to a point one day that I could not get out of bed and I didn't even go to work and on top of that I didn't care. <laughs> you know, you just don't care about the consequences because I realize some people, we tend to do things because we fear the consequences and you get out of bed and you drag yourself to work because you know if you don't, you won't eat. Right. But at this point I got to a point where I didn't care and that's when I got worried. Mm. Uh, before this I had experienced some symptoms like memory loss, some headaches, feeling like my head is being crushed but I never connected them to anything. Mm -hmm. So I went to, at first I saw a neurologist because of my memory mm -hmm. loss, I was losing my short term memory and they checked me and they didn't find anything. They said you're fine, you're just having a bad day or something. So I went back but I was still not able to do anything. I was feeling quite lethargic and apathetic, like mm. you just don't want and you don't care. Right. So one day I, real, I just told myself, what do I have to lose? I walked to the HR office and I told the HR manager, I'm, I'm not able to work and I have no idea why. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the most awkward conversation. I can imagine, because yeah, you were thinking, are they going to let me yeah. go? Am I going to have my job? At I'm quitting. No. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, no, I'm just saying I'm not able to work and I don't know why. I yeah. can't do anything. Right. Yeah, so luckily um, the HR lady, uh, Jane, she just told me, okay, take a few days, go see a doctor, mm -hmm. have a full health checkup, and then you come and get back to me. It was funny because she, she was really supportive. She even took my mom's number. Wow. You know, like just to wow. follow up on me. Right. And so when I went to the doctors, they, you know, they asked me what, what, what's going on. I told them about my lack of mm -hmm. appetite. I'm just describing very physical symptoms. Yes. Yeah, and this doctor called another doctor. Like he told me just pause right yeah. there. I called another doctor in and then they seemed to be discussing something. And then he came, they came, both of them together, and 
he, he asked me, tell this, tell this doctor what you told me, you know. And then I told them the symptoms, and then they, you know, you could, you could see them asking, do you think it's what mm. it is? And then, so this guy, you definitely have depression, but you need to confirm. So they sent me to a, psych, a, 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 a psychiatrist, and immediately, like the moment I talked to a psychiatrist, I, I was put on medication because wow. apparently I had gotten really bad. Mm. And, and, I, and you know, the, the worst thing was, at that time, you don't even want to go to the hospital. You don't want to go anywhere, exactly, which yeah. can be really bad. But but that's when now I discovered what it was, and I got on the journey of, of recovery. Okay, wow. And, and did you actually shared your story on social media. Um, you were very open on just what you had gone through. I mean, walk us through, because this is now your platform yeah. to explain um, your story and and you know also probably why people would react in such a manner. Okay, um, my story with mental illness actually started way earlier, like when I was in primary school. Uh, but in hindsight, I really didn't know that there was something wrong. Yeah. So I was diagnosed with depression in 2013, um, after a very trying time, after my first rape. So I didn't really know what was going on. I was lethargic, I wouldn't shower, I'd spend three weeks in bed. Like work, bed, work, bed, mm. work, bed. I wouldn't talk to anyone. I just wanted to be alone and to be by myself. And of course, during these times, I was um, I had very many suicidal thoughts. Only <laughs> that I was too lazy to do anything about it. Mm. So I was on treatment for depression for three years, 2013 to 2015. Then in December, I met the love of my life. Um, I call him Ruby in in my blog because well, I don't really want people to know who he is. So right. I just call him Ruby. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'm falling in love. I'm hyperactive. I can't sleep, can't eat. You know, like all mm, the symptoms yeah. they describe in the movies about how you're in love. But then my mom realized there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. This isn't normal. So um, I went to hospital. Actually, my mom had to trick me to go to hospital oh. because I was not willing to admit that I had a problem. I was like, no, I've been cured of my depression. Leave me alone. I'm happy. So when I got to hospital, they had to sedate me. Then after reviewing my, my case, my psychiatrist concluded that I had bipolar disorder. And wow. not just bipolar disorder, but bipolar disorder type 1. There are two types. Okay. So I had the first type. Okay. So when I did share my story with Biko, it was the story. It's because he invited people to tell a story about how you've been down mm. and then how you've managed to, you know, get up and like rise like the like the Phoenix. Mm. That's a campaign that was being done by Johnny Walker. So I submitted my story and we had a meeting and we had an interview and I explained this is what I want you to right. say. Just say it. Right. So I didn't actually know that he would have such a backlash because right. I'd already shared the story of my three rapes on the on my blog so whoever was following my blog already knew about it and there was no backlash right. but when Biko Zulu did it I don't know why they were so quick to crucify him and lynch him and say he's condoning rape mm. I think the idea that he was condoning rape came from the fact that I say that I had forgiven my rapists and we're friends and I talked to them though I don't talk to them every day I talk to them on a regular basis if they need help I'm there for them mm -hmm. So I think that's what really pissed people off. Like, right. oh my gosh, she's talking to the people who raped her. But for me, as a Christian and a practicing Roman Catholic, you forgive and forget. Mm. I won't lie, it did not take me a week to forgive and forget. It took me a year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a really hard year where I had to work really hard with my therapist and do a lot of trauma counseling, and now I'm okay. Yeah. So I felt really insulted by people who said, I'm condoning rape or Biko is condoning rape just because I chose to forget to forgive. Right. Because yeah. there's also the aspect of people feeling that you were almost blaming yourself mm -hmm. that because of my condition I put myself in scenarios where this could happen. Mm -hmm. No, not at all. I did not feel that at all, but I understand where they're coming from because they felt that this is a lady or a woman who has a mental illness and mm -hmm. so she's vulnerable mm -hmm. and she can be easily exploited. In fact, those are the words they were using that. Yeah. yeah, so they said some really harsh things. And that's the thing, sometimes, you know, when you have a mental illness, you're pegged as someone who is not fully normal and cannot make sound decisions, decisions. Yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and even for you, going through your experience, yeah. What was it like when you first found out and now having to get treatment and everything? Yes, I went to a cardiologist, mm -hmm. neurologist. I was everywhere. Wow. No one ever knew what was wrong with me. And then I was frightened because I call my story the day I turned myself in mm. because I realized, okay, I need help. But then what kind of help can I get? 
and then reading books, watching movies, I know the kind of help I could get. It's medication and therapy, but then this kind of medication, will it work? Yeah. What happens if it takes me to a place I can never come back from? You know, yeah. and then how, how much is it? Is it too expensive? Will we be able to afford it? Mm. So what would you say, was so, it brought on by circumstances or is it something that maybe ran in the family that kind of cropped up? Well, to be honest, I've never found out what it was because um, I had just finished university, I was doing my thesis and then I got this job. It was hectic as well. Yeah. So I started becoming sick more frequently mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then it reaches the times where I wouldn't be able to leave bed and anything. I couldn't, I couldn't understand myself. And then this moving from one doctor to another, not understanding anything, misdiagnosis, taking medication for this, working with a heart monitor, doing this. I was confused. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, um, Dr. Gitao, sometimes we'll have people wonder, and I know this is probably an argument in, in, the, the, in the science industry, where is mental illness a physical issue, a physical illness, or is it something that's brought on by negative thoughts. I had a bad day, so <laughs> you know, I'm depressed. <laughs> what is it usually brought on by? There are several causes of uh, mental illness, because you might be affected mentally, and you also find yourself physically, you are actually affected. Uh, listening to their cases, uh, like when we get to the physical um, a part of it, how does mental health or mental illness affect us physically? Right. Like people with depression, uh, when they have their manic episodes, they are very, very active. They can do so many things. They are restless. They can actually do also amazing productions. See, for example, they're in the media like when mm. it was. Or when they go to the downside of it, they don't want anything and they actually don't care. Mm -hmm. And that's the point when they really think of committing suicide. Right. Uh, when you talk about the cognitive uh, aspect of it, so many rational thoughts. You start losing interest in things you loved and you're like, what for? It doesn't add value. You find that they are thinking, uh, if it's in terms of work, somebody starts thinking they're actually not appreciated, which is not true. There's so many irrational mm. thoughts at that particular moment. Yeah. When it comes to the emotional part of it, you may really affect your loved ones. They are there for you, they want to give you attention, you're not interested, yeah. you're not even uh, focusing on that. And some of them think you're pretending. For example, somebody right. wants, to, somebody yeah. wants to, to take you out and you're like, no, I'm not interested. And they're so psyched up mm. to take you out. Right. And so they say, this one is just a sadist. They mm. don't know you're actually in your own dark world. Right. Uh, so you, you may find that emotionally you become disturbed and you disturb other people. Mm. When it comes to the spiritual part, I, I just like her approach. Uh, though maybe in psychology we don't really talk of forgiveness, but we talk of letting go. Yes. And that was the most beautiful way of letting go because when you keep staying in the same spot, you're not helping yourself. Mm. I'm, I'm listening to her case and I'm wondering, does it run in the family? You may not know unless a very good assessment, family history is done. Like in her case, rape is so traumatizing. Yes. And what happens is that the whole aspect of you changes. And in that case, you keep thinking, what have I lost about myself, my dignity and all that? And it can also make you have irrational thoughts that are very typical of depression. Okay. So trauma can cause actually depression, mm. step by step, right. if somebody is not treated. Uh, we have the case of Eva. Eva uh, did her schooling very well. But probably if you had to track her history, she was always perfect, wanting things to be mm -hmm. good. And you know, the family may be paid, you know, uh -huh, uh -huh. like I've seen your mom come with you over here. <laughs> <laughs> so the trigger could actually be the workplace. Mm. You could be having the predisposition. Mm. We all are, can, can get depressed. The only thing is that people with, without genetic predisposition, they may not get so far, okay. but they can have mild depression. Okay. And it's good for everybody to take this test. We have a very simple test called Beck uh, depres Depression Inventory. Mm -hmm. You can actually get it online. It has 21 items mm -hmm. and it will tell you whether you're mild, uh, moderate or severe. severe. Amazing. <laughs> and we'll get more into that even in terms yes, of yeah. treatment and just to be more aware of what mental illness really is. Let's take a short break here on Victoria's Lounge. We'll be right back.
All right, welcome back. You're watching Victoria's Lounge. Now, we're talking about the whole treatment aspect of all this. Um, Cornell, you said, I was actually glad that I was sick, that you actually found out what this was. Because um, it's one thing to be diagnosed, it's another to actually accept, you know. And, and for you, have you gotten to the point of accepting that, hey, this is me? Um, yeah, if you look at my, uh, like in, on the blogs and online, I started writing about mental health after I discovered mm -hmm. that I had it. And prior to that, I, I kind of did not really care. Yeah. I, I, I knew people had mental health problems and there was, it was those people right. and it's not me. Right. But now I realized that there was a lot of ignorance and, and what struck me was how many people are like me, they do not even know what they have and they're silently suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is one thing to suffer and know what you have and just choose not to get help. Right. But it is another thing to to not even know you need help. And and so you, you because as a human being cannot stay like in, in blank, you have to find a category for what you have and yeah. people go, You're crazy. And so the relief for me came with the fact that I no longer needed to put myself in categories that were destructive to mm. me. You know, like yeah. I'm just weird or I'm just you know, you're hopeless, yeah, you yeah. never amount to anything, all those things, because when you are depressed, those things make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm good for nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you actually added humor to it because you call it custom made madness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, which, you know, people now would have a different way of looking at it. Exactly. You know, that, yeah, I could be considered someone who has totally lost it, but no, I actually have full control of my life. Mm -hmm. And actually allowing the public to see that part of mental illness. You know, uh, Dr. Gitao, when it comes to treatment, because a lot of them explained one of the symptoms as feeling nothing. Mm. And, and a lot of times, how can you treat nothing? You know, when you feel <laughs> absolutely feel nothing. nothing, you don't know what you're feeling, you don't know why you're feeling that way. Mm. How do you even begin that process? Well, uh, and, and treatment is, is uh, quite uh, complex at times, yeah. especially when the case is overwhelming and you really need the psychiatric intervention. So we tell patients, we tell family to comply because their incidences, the symptoms are just too overproductive. Mm -hmm. So if the patient is not put on medication, you're not helping them. Mm -hmm. But there is a level whereby you may actually need to be weaned off the medication and you start on psychotherapy. Okay. And that is where most of our counseling psychologist work comes in, whereby he's saying, I can tell my story without being blocked. Mm -hmm. that I, we call it the narrative, you know, uh, therapy that I just talk those things that maybe are uh, not making sense to anybody else, yeah. but they can make sense to me as a therapist. Okay. Uh, the incidence is where we have to reconstruct the thinking. Yeah, when somebody is thinking I'm good for nothing, we yeah. look at achievements in their life. You know, if it was that class one that you lead in the class. <laughs> Still or, an uh, achievement. Some, this yeah. is it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, we also have the behavioral part of it, where we say now here we have to handle your behavior. For example, somebody says, I'm not feeling like going to work. Yeah. So in the workplace, they will not consider it as an illness as such. They look at their productivity. Mm -hmm. So we, we tell you we really need to deal with this behavior. Yeah. Uh, there are instances where somebody is very irritable, they have anger outbursts, so we have to tell them, you have to remember you're not alone in this world. Right. So a lot of behavior therapy needed there. Yeah. A bit of it may require some uh, psychoanalytic approach, mm -hmm. uh, digging out some past, just to understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I, I'm very happy when uh, your mother told you, oh, we've always known you like this. Mm -hmm. There are these the children you may find in the family that uh, they like keeping to themselves, yes. they lock themselves up in the room. But parents are not aware. It's like, ah, that's my, my son or my daughter. Mm. She's yeah, just reserved. Right. They're exactly. introverted. But when it is, um, you, you can see it's done over and over again, you need to be worried. Yeah. Incidences whereby your child is not even happy with their performance, even if yeah. they slightly have dropped. Yeah, the OCD they are talking about, mm. the obsessive compulsive disorder. Right cleanliness, you know, want it to be perfect, if they are books, they put their clothes in a particular way. As a parent, even if you're happy with the older, mm -hmm. you also need to be a bit aware yeah, that yeah. this is something that can cause my child a problem. Yeah. What about relationships? You may find that they find something very small in their relationships and the relationship is cut off. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how many relationships they're going to have in their life. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. A lot. I can see Cornell and Dina just like, oh yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and they really break many hearts. <laughs> yeah. 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 But do are people aware? Is the society aware? So we can have medication, we can have the cognitive restructuring, we can have the behavioral approach, and we can also have the spiritual. Not the way it's done in church. We actually talk of logotherapy, yeah. making meaning out of a meaningless situation, mm. yeah. uh, whereby you, 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 you actually ask somebody a, a question they least expect. Yeah. 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 What do you find good about your situation? What? There's nothing good. <laughs> <laughs> but as you interact with them, you continue with the interview, they actually find something okay. good. Like he says, he used to ignore mental health right but and now, now he's like and this one thing you find with i mean you know you shared in your post how you can sense when you're about to slip into an episode so there's an, a heightened self-awareness yeah. that comes with this has mm -hmm. that helped it has really helped um i actually um when she talked about logotherapy yeah. um i remembered victor frankl's Victor Frank, e yeah. yeah, Victor Frankl's book. Mm. It talks about how it's actually the meaning of life, I think. Yeah. It's an amazing book which I've been reading. Mm. And I'm also doing yeah. something called mood mapping. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I have an like a mood app on my phone. It okay. reminds me like every couple of hours to remind me like where am where am I? What am I feeling? So that allows me to know what my trigger is. Yeah. So if I'm next to a person who makes me really upset. I turn off my phone, I walk away from that person, I do yoga for five minutes, mm. then I come back. So there's a lot of self-awareness when it comes to therapy treatment, not just medication. Yes, yeah. Because yeah. medication as well can make you have all these terrible symptoms. Like I'm on this medication called Valters. Oh my gosh, it is not from heaven. <laughs> because it gives me, gives me the worst, worst possible side effects. Oh, no. I'm irritable, mm. I'm angry, I have like super bad cramps, I have migraines. I see I'm very, I'm overly sensitive. So mm. at work, people have to walk on eggshells around me. So it's a lot of uh, balancing medication and therapy and, therapy. and also okay. doing your own personal right. healing. So mapping your moods and stuff. And another issue also is access to medication because it can be quite expensive, you know, and I know Eva, you have tried through your foundation to kind of get subsidized yeah. uh, treatment for um, a lot of people who are going through mental illness. But I mean, talk about how important that is to have access to those. And do those drugs actually work? Okay, well, different approaches can be used to work. I mean, yes, the medication is expensive, but look, um, we're talking about being mentally healthy. Yeah. So if you can't afford the medication, is there anything else you can do to boost yeah. your mood? Well, yes, there's physical exercises. You can do that. You can do yoga. You know, mm. I mean, there's so many other things you can do to boost your mood, you know, right, eat right. certain kinds of foods, be around certain kind of people to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? And the thing is also, you know, raising awareness among the people around you, loved ones, colleagues. You know, Cornell, you said you went into the HR department and said, there's something wrong, I don't know what, you know. And they were gracious enough to say, all right, let's go have you checked out. And I don't know how many employers would actually do that. You know, they would say, this one, <laughs> we, we may have to kind of let go. But I mean, in a scenario where someone doesn't have the grace that you did, what are they to do? For me, after I talked to to HR and I was given some time off to to get um, to get help, when I came back and and I would write about um, I would write about my experiences and there's a time I dared to share. You know, sometimes yeah. you don't share some things in the office; you just share outside. And, and so I dared to share it in one of the WhatsApp groups in the office. And at this, at just like a few minutes after I shared the, a post. You know, people coming out of the woodworks. Mm. All of a sudden. Yeah, like this, you know, hey, you know, I've also been dealing with A, B, C, Like, these now and you these. tell me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I think, it, it, you know, sometimes someone might not be able to go straight to the top or straight to the boss. Yes. But, but you can go to your colleague. Right. And, and that's, that's, I think that's, I guess it's the only sensible or the most sensible step mm. one can take. And, and just dare to be different because you have especially at that moment you really have nothing to lose you're just waiting to be fired yeah <laughs> so, you know so exactly. you might as well do something about right, it right right so it's it, there's a change of mindset that one 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 has to embrace you i know it's the most irrational time you know at that time you're not very <laughs> rational and and that irrationality is part of the symptom which is becomes mm. a self-fulfilling prophecy but I, I guess we need to to look out for one another because I have started spotting people who are like me. Oh. <laughs> you, know, you, you kind of can see. Yeah, yeah, can yeah tell you that. just see and you're like, oh yeah, I get. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, the, the, uh, when, now when you reach out and you're like, you know, 
you can do A, B, C, and D. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow the help has to come from outside, mm -hmm. and, and 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 not. It's not always possible for the help to come from inside because you have a problem inside. The problem yeah. is already inside, exactly. so you need an alien help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in speaking of which, we'll get to that. Raising awareness is really about everyone being aware <laughs> of those around them, not just yourself. Let's take a short break on Victoria's Lounge. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. I hope you're keeping the discussion going on social media. Remember, hashtag Victoria's Lounge is how you can always chime in to the discussion. Uh, now, when it comes to raising awareness, um, Eva, let me start with you, because sometimes we can think that people overcome it, you know, like I've gone through medication, yeah. I've gone through therapy, I'm past it. Do you ever get over depression or mental illness, or is it still with you? Well, the thing is, you don't get over it. I think you learn to live with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You learn to live with it and know how to bring yourself back when you go through the manic phase, when, you, when you're at your low state, you know how to bring yourself back to the same position you were previously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as you live with it, it gets easier because then you know what's happening to you. Mm. What do you think? I disagree. You will not always have it. Because, for example, for bipolar disorder, it peaks. Okay, first of all, it's as common as the flu. One in every four people will have it. It's actually really common. It's just that people don't talk about it. Uh. So, and then mostly when you're in your 20s, that's when it tends to manifest itself. Then after your 30s, you kind of like slow down and then your body's just normal. So mm. I actually know three people who are my relatives and they're okay. You get past it. They don't need medication. They don't go for therapy. They're as normal as the blue sky. Mm. So you can get over it. And it's not something that you have to live with for the rest of your life. You yeah. might use that experience that you went through to teach but it actually ends mental illness can be cured mm -hmm. that's I mean, what i believe dr guitar because you have interactions with <laughs> all sorts of yeah. individuals what's your take on it yes yeah like the awareness actually we say awareness is the heartbeat of therapy like she's aware so she knows and she right. tells even friends don't don't treat me mm. don't become my therapist mm. that awareness becomes your protection yeah. that awareness becomes your guard and that really should be for Everyone. 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 Yes, yeah. including you and me, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> if we haven't gone into the yeah, yeah, yeah. you need to be alert. Yeah. And uh, what I, I find in Kenya is that medical health is given a lot of uh, 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 preference. Exactly. Right now, we are talking a lot about alcohol and substance yeah. in induced uh, yeah. psychosis. We also have substance induced depression. Like mm. alcoholism in yes. itself. Yes. Is, yeah, like is, I can't is, take alcohol. This is it. You, you yeah. get what you I mean? Take you but over but the you edge, know yeah. in the inside, if you try it, where you get yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're aware, this is who I am, I don't deny. But I don't get myself into situations that I will actually have an episode. Yeah. 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 Probably what I find our government may be lacking in is the fact that she could afford medication. Mm -hmm. She, mm -hmm. he. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the poor people? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about the insurance companies? How many of them will take your card if they yeah. say, oh, you've yeah. been diagnosed with depression, mm. diagnosed with schizophrenia? How many of them will cover you for that? Right. I long for the day our country will actually treat mental health just like any mm. other illness. Mm. And we don't have to see them fearing to actually come out. We don't have to see families also locking up their loved ones yeah. in the, in the house. Treating them differently. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm also looking forward to a day that every company every employer will actually have a counselor who can do the assessment okay. like you said mm -hmm. okay. such mm -hmm. that the work cannot become a trigger I, i'm actually uh, saying kudos to your hr <laughs> yeah because how many of them will tell you exactly. go, go and seek treatment right right they'll actually say you're wasting the company's time and the profits are supposed mm. to make and look at the flip side of that in, when it comes to family in it the break you had um, alluded to the fact of friends and family who are close to you they know what's going on but they will try to diagnose you and say this is happening now mm -hmm. as opposed to offering support exactly um, so what should loved ones do I think what loved ones should do is just be family or be friends do not be the therapist don't be the psychiatrist what happens a lot is I think I also kind of understand where they're coming from because yeah. when you do have a mental illness you have moments of money and you have moments of depression so people don't really know how to treat you and they're also mm -hmm. walking on eggshells around you mm -hmm. but when you're finally aware the only thing you can do is just respect the other person if they say 
I am fine just because I express an emotion doesn't make me manic. Right. Or you find a you find like some really really nice song you like and you start dancing in the office. Yeah. The like and then someone says, "Oh my gosh, she's breaking. She's going to start cursing and screaming out." <laughs> you know, just to appreciate that this thing that they do are normal. Dancing yeah. is a normal thing. How is that being managed? It's quite right. helpful, actually. Yeah. yeah. Is it like almost defining a new normal though? Because Cornell, mm-hmm. you had written once that you have to work twice as hard to be normal. <laughs> 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 Which I found really funny. But I mean, what does that mean exactly? First of all, being aware that you're not normal or, or, or sometimes even being aware that, okay, this is happening. Yeah. I'm having that episode right now. But the rest of the world is moving on as if oh. as if as if you're not and, and for, for like even for me like in my own relationship there are times when my fiance knows i have i have these episodes but now when they come and catch her off guard you know uh-huh. completely and now she's still trying to reason with me and trying yeah. to, get me, to get me to be normal and and so you realize oh so i i really don't need to be babied yeah. Because you know, you know, you can't, you can't be like, hey, I'm depressed. You should leave me alone. <laughs> now you realize, okay, they don't really realize. They it. don't, and you, yeah. And you kind of, uh, as I was saying, now work twice as hard. Okay. To, to kind of uh, push, push yourself, uh, uh, like to, to, to the normal bit. Right, right. And, and, and I was, on, I was talking about the. You're talking about awareness, and one of the ways I have found effective, even for me, in, in terms of in my platform as, as a journalist, has been there are many things can say many facts about mental illness that people are not aware of and and so you'll find like right now people don't know that suicide is a crime in Kenya wow. you know committing suicide is a misdemeanor maximum of two years and and <laughs> and and the statistics from WHO show that around yeah. 7,000 people commit suicide every year in Kenya and 90 percent of those can be traced back to mental health. Right. So no one knows that. In the US, people com- people commit crimes and they talk about mental health and you're like, they're just trying to evade issues. Exactly. It's the guns, yeah. you know, right. it's all this. But no one has asked, wait, what about here? How, has anyone ever mentioned no, mental health yes. when we have these problems, right. when we have domestic violence, yeah. when we have wow. People, people going to for those raids yeah. in the drunk drinking dens. Oh, yeah. No one thinks of so mental it's health. Shifting from <laughs> not making it look like it's escapist, mm-hmm. exactly. to this is a legitimate reason okay. yeah. behind yeah. why we're experiencing where we are. I mean, Eva, how can we have a healthy view of mental illness and mental health? Um, first of all, we need to have a healthy view by eradicating the stigma, which is the main cause of the problem. And I feel that by doing this, we could do this either by raising awareness to the stigmatizer, not to the stigmatized, mm. because they are the ones who are not aware about what is happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, Cornelia had also said in terms of you being more aware yeah. when someone is dealing with you, because you're like, okay, I have to understand where they're coming from. Yeah. So I don't take offense to how they react to me. Yeah. yeah. You know? It's 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 kind of. Um, as I said earlier during the break, it's helping others help you. And, and, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that's the only way. Mm-hmm. You yeah. you kind of have to to have more grace so that you can receive it. You know. <laughs> and if you just flipped out, everyone would lose. They would be yeah. more confused, and you'd be more destroyed. Right. Right. So, so I mean, I will finish with you, Doctor Gitao. I mean, it seems like more of a burden because you're already dealing with this, and then I have to worry about mm-hmm. handling someone else with care. <laughs> like, handle me with care, you know, <laughs> since I'm going through. Actually, but how do you balance that? Yeah, I, I like the way they are approaching it because finally, even when we are helping them, that's where we want them to be—to be helpers. Okay. Right, and uh, I, I am also liking what uh, he said about the fiance. They actually don't know what's happening to you. Mm-hmm. So today you're in very good moods, tomorrow you're just a different person. Yeah. And because the other person may not be aware, you need to make them aware so that they understand. Even families where they have understood their, their siblings, that's the way they are, they actually know when to give them time off. Yeah. And because they know they'll, they'll come back. Mm. Uh, this is my prayer is even for the workplaces, that they can know uh, when maybe their workmate is, is actually in, in the face. Maybe they are down into depression so that they give them time. They always come back. What they don't like is what they've said, that you try to sympathize, yeah. you try yeah. to be their doctor. They don't like it because it's like, it's just a matter of time, I'll be okay. Mm. And I want to support what she said, physical, physical exercises. Mm-hmm. Dancing is very, very healthy, yeah. actually, for people who are, are struggle with depression. 
because what it does it wakes up the the part of their brain you know the dopamine side increased yeah, yeah. Mm. and and it's good so when <laughs> so if, yeah. if, if we know like she's like that we don't have to say oh she's manic now yeah. allow her to dance <laughs> Uh, a lot of yoga, yoga is also helping, although many people also are very yeah. superstitious yeah, about yeah. They think yoga. It's like meditating and attracting yes. evil spirits. This From what it, we've seen yeah. in the movies and yeah. everything. But the yeah. other one is choice of the partner, especially a lifetime uh -huh. partner, uh -huh. because very many people have been taken back into the big oh, hall yeah. by mm. their partners. Mm. Yeah. That's why you hear cases in the family of suicide and homicide. Yeah. Because yeah. you tend to think the other person is aware of what is going through in your mind and what you do, you like. They're, it's like they're taking advantage, they're mm. rejoicing in me. Probably for our government, it's a high time they gave us the National Board for Counselors and Psychologists. Mm. Because in Kenya, uh, the, the survey that was done in 2011, we have 777 psychiatrists mm -hmm. yeah. for the whole nation and 418 psychiatric nurses. They are not enough. But we have over 5,000 uh, counselors and over 4,000 psychologists. The psychiatrist cure and curative part of mental health is very expensive. Why don't they give us that job of right. prevention right. so that we can actually do the psychoeducation? And if they could also uh, integrate the mental health in primary health care, I know they are trying, but not in all parts mm. of the country. Mm. Some, some county uh, hospitals don't have the primary mental health care. They need to integrate this. And if they can have, for example, if you go to the slums of Kibra and Mathari, there are so many cases of mental health. Yeah. Can we have community-based mental health units within Mathari? So that these people who later on kill one another, they get into alcoholism because they want to run away from depression, they don't have to do that anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, you guys, you're already therapists in your own way. In your own way, yeah. exactly. Yeah, by telling so your going story. Forth. Oh, yeah. You know? It's about time they enacted the bill. Like, we're still working with the Mental Act of 1989. Why, why have they taken so long to do the one of 2014, mm. 2015? Right. Yeah. And I think if they, if they actually decided to do like the mental health policy formulation and all these things they're saying they'll do, like it's great that our constitution actually protects people with mental health. Right. With the the mental act. health issues, it's mm. there in the act, yeah. but there's nothing that's being done about it. I just started this initiative the Mental Health Awareness Center basically is to raise awareness from the grassroots. I mean, let's go to high school because that's mm. where it begins. They start maturing and everything. Mm. That's where things start happening. I mean, start picking up personalities. Then university students, let them be aware of what's going on with them mm -hmm. so that it's not such a problem right. or it's, it's not a taboo topic anymore. Yeah. So basically, it's just raising awareness with, with them. That, that's my target audience. And then also looking at vulnerable groups, uh, that's mm. what we do. So starting yeah. the conversation much earlier on. We don't yeah. have to wait till someone is an adult and yeah. realize, yeah. oh, something could be wrong. Yeah. So thank you so much to Cornell, Dr. Gitao, AKA Counselor Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Enid and Eva, thank you so much for your insights. And let's mm -hmm. keep the conversation going. Mental health is not something that you need to go through by yourself. And if you're not someone who thinks that you have a mental illness, be aware, be alert, you never know you could actually be saving your life and someone else's. Thanks for watching Victoria's Lounge. I'm Victoria Rubadiri. Thank you to Fairmont, the Norfolk for hosting us. Let's do this again next week. Sema tumulikwe. Oh, we're standing by. Okay. But it was natural. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>